You're listening to the Vox Media Podcast Network. This is What the Heck with Mike Heck on MMAFighting.com. Now, here is your host, Mike Heck. What the heck? Well, hello there, everybody. Welcome to a brand new edition of What the Heck on MMAFighting.com. My name is Mike Heck. Hope you're all having a great week, and I hope you are all enjoying this last reprieve from MMA and the UFC for quite some time. We're coming off three events in eight days, starting with UFC 249, wrapping up with UFC on ESPN 8, all those events taking place in Jacksonville, and this trio of events had it all right big finishes there's some questionable judging and decisions some really good back and forth scraps the events the fights they were very good i enjoyed them very much i know a lot of you guys did as well we're not going to dive into the specifics of the events we cover them all during our event post shows so you can head back into the archives and get our thoughts on those events via our youtube page which you're probably watching this right now or wherever it is you're listening to this right now, wherever it is you find your favorite podcast. The UFC is off this weekend, but then next Saturday, May 30th, they're gonna be off and running again. There are cards, at least with fights being finalized on them through June 27th. So every Saturday night from next Saturday, May 30th through all of June, you're gonna get a UFC card. So if you've been missing MMA, you want more, you're gonna get it. And a lot of these cards are starting to come together, but I have had a lot of people reach out to me over the last couple of days after we reported a bunch of fights for future cards, and they're excited that these events are coming together, but there is a concern right now amongst fans because as we record this, there's only four fights officially announced for next Saturday night's event, which includes the main event between Tyron Woodley and Gilbert Burns. So here's what I know from a general sense, okay? The UFC is having a a bit of difficulty putting this card together. It's to be expected with everything going on in the world. But I can't dive into all the specifics at this very moment, but I can tell you that there are, to my knowledge, at least five or six fights that have been at least verbally agreed upon. A couple of them are really, really interesting too, and hopefully, We will be able to share that information soon, maybe even later on in the program. But what a fun show this is going to be nonetheless. So let's get to the lineup. Let's get right into this thing. You don't want to hear from me anymore. You want to hear from the fighters. Later on in the show, one of the big winners from UFC Jacksonville. Last Wednesday, he returned to the UFC, picked up a big TKO win to kick off the card over Ike Villanueva. Chase Sherman is going to join us to recap his victory, his road back to the octagon, and much more. I really enjoyed this conversation. I really wish I could have had an extra 30 minutes or so with him, but unfortunately, we were on a time schedule and we ran out of time. Sandwiched in the middle of two recent winners from that eight-day stretch, we're going to hear from Colby Covington. He returns to the show, and man, does he have a lot to say and a lot to get off his chest. I know this doesn't surprise a lot of you, but I will say when this conversation was over, I was like, whoa, this was uh, this was something else. So we'll speak with Colby Chaos Covington in a little under 20 minutes from right now. But first, we're going to kick things off with one of the big winners from Saturday night's card, UFC on ESPN 8, Kevin Holland, who defeated Anthony Hernandez. Took him a little over 90 seconds to get the job done. His first finish in the UFC via strikes. He does have a submission win under his belt. And the trailblazer... As you guys may have heard during the post-fight press conference, and you'll hear more in this conversation right now, he doesn't want to rest for very long. In fact, he doesn't really want to rest at all. He has some names in mind, so let's hear from the man himself, one of the big winners from Saturday, Kevin Holland, right now. All right, we're being joined by one of the big winners from Saturday night's event in Jacksonville, Florida. It took him a little over 90 seconds to put away Anthony Hernandez. Back in the win column is the trailblazer, Kevin Holland. How are you, man? Doing good, doing good. How about yourself? I'm doing great. You don't even look like you've been in a fight, man. Nah, mm, you know, a little on I don't think that's <laughs> such. <laughs> that was a, a hell of a, uh, of a performance on Saturday night. First finish of your UFC career. How does it all feel less than 48 hours later? Uh, it feels pretty good. You know what I mean? Um, the chance for getting to fight in two weeks. So, you know, back at the gym today, you know, 
just happy to get there. There you go. I'll admit it. I know I'm not alone here because the odds makers looked at it the same way. I thought this is sort of a coin flip fight on paper because Anthony is a very tough guy. He was coming off a submission win in his last fight, and you went in there and delivered that performance that people have been waiting to see from you since you got into the UFC. I mean, of course, getting the win is top priority, but how important was it for you to go in there and make a statement like you did on Saturday night? Uh, it was pretty important. You know what I mean? Definitely wanted to make a good statement, but I think overall, you know what I mean? Just wanted to go out there and be a vintage Kev. You know, I didn't want to, didn't want to do too much. Didn't want to do too little. I wanted to go out there and kind of like my back in my XKO days. I wanted to perform, you know, do you, that was tight. (laughs) Do you, (laughs) do you, um, do you pay attention to like the outside noise at all? Because it seems like everybody has been universally high on you and everyone felt like, you had a, a ton of potential and everyone felt like the type of performance that you had on Saturday, that you had that in you. And then you finally let it out on Saturday night. Is that something that you pay attention to maybe for a little extra locker room material or anything like that? Yeah. I, I mean, I see everything, you know what I mean? Uh, I see it all. I, I go through all the comments and stuff, you know what I mean? I uh, have a good time with it, but uh, ultimately nah, you know what I mean? It's, what I was going to do is what I was going to do. You know what I mean? It wasn't too much, stressing anybody else i i knew what i wanted you know i wanted a quick check that'd be nice so went ahead and tried to get the quick check and it, it happened you know it was like uh he wanted to test cardio so i was i mean i was prepared to do what we had to do but you know if i can get the fight over with quick let's do it speaking of having fun talk about two totally different demeanors heading into that fight like even on saturday you walk to the cage loose as a goose you're smiling you're dancing you're singing you're having a good time and then anthony comes out looking intense look to have been staring you down the entire time. How would you describe that feeling of making that walk and preparing to get locked in a cage for upwards of 15 minutes? Like what goes on in your mind? Let's have fun. You know what I mean? It's a, it's a party. I'm, you see, I'm dancing, I'm, I'm jigging. I'm, I'm uh, ultimately, I just, I like it. Yeah. I really, really love fighting. So it's, it's no stress to me. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm like, I'm about to get my check. Let's go. <laughs> you know? So I'm happy. You know what I mean? I, you never know how the fight's going to turn out, you know, but you always hope that it turns out something like that. So, I mean, for it to turn out the way it turned out, I was happy with it. You landed that beautiful knee to the body that set up the finish of the fight. Was there something in the preparation that led you to believe that the body would be a big target for you? Yeah, I got a teammate, you know, when he starts to cut a lot of weight or when he starts to slim down too much, his, his body gets a little uh, a little softer than usual. And uh, to me, they were built the same. So I was like, I got a feeling the body would be soft. And so uh, we've been going over the elbow and to the knees. And so uh, vintage Muay Thai type stuff with a lamb track consistent twist. You know, you put that little angle on it after you get it done. So uh, through the elbow, kind of cut the angle a little bit through the knee to the body. I thought my second knee would do it. You know what I mean? I thought it was going to have to be a couple of reinforced knees. But the first knee, I heard him go. "Uh!" And so I just followed up with a combo. You know what I mean? A couple knees. And then he was going down. So I was like, strike it out. You know what I mean? Just keep pounding. And uh, ref pulled me off, and I was like, I ain't even talk. I didn't slap him. You know what I mean? I didn't do none of my signature things, but it's all right. It's a check. You know what I mean? I like the checks. <laughs> Maybe that's a sign now. Just You don't have to say anything or slap anybody. You just get quick checks and move on to the next one. You know, honestly, I like it because it's like uh, the clout. You know what I mean? Get a little clout when you finish people like that. I was at like 7K on Instagram. You know what I mean? Now I'm at like 11. I'm like, ooh, look at all these honeys in my inbox. Let's go, bucko. <laughs> <laughs> and now you've got all these Johnny Come Lately reporters coming out trying to talk to you, I bet. I've been talking nah. to you for a while, so I don't consider myself that kind of a nah, guy. No, nah, no, nah. You know, I don't I only do interviews if my manager tells me to. You know, I, I like when I first got in UFC, I was like, I'll take any interview. And he was like, No, 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 no. Only do the ones I tell you to do. So if they're not hitting up Warren, you know what I mean, or hitting up my boy, you know what I mean, Justin Adams, I'm not I'm not doing it. You know, there you I, go. I get in trouble. You know, I don't want to get cussed out by my manager. So sorry. Guys. That's what you gotta <laughs> do, man. Yeah. It's uh, there's a lot of talk about fighting in an empty arena, but you fought on the Contender Series in 2018. So this is, and this is before the Apex and the bleachers were full of people. So fighting in an empty arena wasn't a huge change for you, I'd assume. No, I mean, ultimately, it almost felt like a street fight. You know what I mean? You got in there and it was like nobody. It was like when he pulled me off, I was kind of thinking like, oh, like I, at first I didn't think about the ref. Like when he first went to touch me, I really wasn't thinking about the ref. You know what I mean? It's kind of like got locked in. And then like when he like pulled me off, I was like, Oh, the cops are pulling me off. Like, I'm in trouble. For me. <laughs> you know what I mean? Then I realized, like, no, no, we're in the fight. We're in the fight. We're good to go. Uh, I like it like that. You know, it was, 
it's old school. Let's go, let's do it that way. I like it that way. It was good. Does that happen to you before? Yeah, you know, been a lot of street fights. You know what I mean? You're a kid, you get in a fight at school, security guard touches you. I mean, you don't stay there. You try to run. Ah, oh, hopefully they don't know who I am. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, yeah, I mean, it was nice. I like it a lot. What did you think of the overall fight week experience during a, a global pandemic, the testing sort of being sequestered to, to one location overall? What was that like for you? Test in the nose. I hated that. But uh, overall, I uh, I thought it was cool, man. You know, I we were a little isolated. We don't have to worry about random people in the lobby trying to take pictures and stuff. I mean, that's dope. But I mean, that's what that's what the mock way ends. You know, when we go do it for the people, that's what that's for. You know, that's what five weeks or four and stuff like that. Certain days are for that. But sometimes when you're walking through the lobby, you know, you just want a place to relax. You know what I mean? You don't want to be stuck in your room the whole time. So I like it. And I enjoyed the whole experience. I like it either way. I mean, to me, it really doesn't make a difference. You know what I mean? If we get a little peace, we get the peace. If there's a lot of people, we get a lot of people. Me personally, coming off a loss, I mean, I wanted to just zero in. And I zeroed in. And then, you know, I get to see what I could be like inside the UFC if I zero in. And it was nice. Do you feel like a different guy now? Do you feel like the momentum has swung in your favor and that you're kind of on this rocket ship, so to speak? I mean, I don't know yet. It's just one fight. You know what I mean? It's like, uh, it's gonna be like three or four in a row, you know? So that's more so what I'm worried about. You know, one fight, I don't really feel like it makes a big difference. You know, I'm still coming off a loss, you know? So it's like, I still got choked out. You know what I mean? I finished a guy. I finished a guy that beat a guy that beat me. You know what I mean? That finished me. So it's like, it's good, but... It's not good enough. You're not letting yourself get too excited. You're happy with the win, ready yeah. to come back in two weeks, but we're not going to get too excited yet. Yeah, yeah. If I can come back two weeks, you know, against Mickey Gall, you know, and I beat Mickey Gall, I feel like that makes up for it. You know what I mean? Uh, we could argue who has better jiu-jitsu, you know, Allen or Gall, you know? So I feel like, I feel like that'd be dope, you know? And it's like, uh, I mean, damn, wouldn't that be wonderful if I submit Mickey Gall? You know what I mean? Everybody's like, you're going to knock him out. I mean, what if I, if I tap him out? So... <laughs> That'd be pretty dope. <laughs> so what's the latest on this potential quick turnaround for you? I will say that I was uh, texting back and forth forth with Oren, uh, Odin on Friday or on Saturday during the fight. And I was like, damn, what a, what a great win. Yeah. And we were kind of talking because I was like, is there, is it, could he actually come back and fight again in two weeks? And he basically gave me a smiley face emoji and, and here we are. So how real is this? Is there is something in the works here? Yeah. So I think it's in the works. So if we get, you know, Mickey Gall, you know, if he accepts the fight, you know what I mean? That's dope because, you know, I'm going to accept the fight. Um, I'm really in the fight. But if he doesn't, you know what I mean? In two to three weeks, they need somebody to go again. It's like if something happens with the Vittori fight, you know, I know I'm supposed to be committed to the 170 thing right now. But it's like, like I said, if something happens with the Vittori fight, I want Marvin Vittori. You know, it's like it's probably not the smartest fight to take, but he's running his mouth. So for me, it's the smartest fight to take if it comes around. I'll take it, you know. So uh, whatever the wind blows. I would love to take the Mickey golf fight, but Vittori kind of feel like he's a dumb fighter. So yeah, it'd be, be a fun fight. So what, like what happened? I mean, you, you got a little heated at the post fight talking about Marvin um, and you, you sort of got into why you were, were so upset with him, but you know, you called him a name that I'm not really going to say here, but you know, what, what's sort of the antithesis of how this all came to be? Like, why are you, I called him a cat really and snake, right? Call him a cat and a snake. Let's put it that way. I call him yes. a cat and a snake. Uh, first and foremost, he, he shook my hand. You know what I mean? He shook my hand down in the lobby. We talked about fighting. I told him I'd be down to fight Wednesday, and then I'd be down to turn around and fight uh, Saturday night. You know, and if that wasn't the case, you know what I mean? I said, if they're down, to make it a tournament base. You know what I mean? Like a tournament format, and I'll fight you. You know, I'll fight you. Um, try to make, get this camera back right. There we go. I'll fight you, you know what I mean, a couple times. You know what I mean? Like, however we got to do it, I don't care. You know what I mean? Like, I'm trying to make it so that way you get your fight, you get a chance to make show and win money, or you can just take your show. I don't care. You know what I mean? I'm just trying to help you out. Um, so we talked. You know, it was a good conversation. I thought it was really respectful. I thought it was nice. Then he went upstairs. I guess he dropped something on Instagram talking about he's babysitting these guys. We're a bunch of babies. He's putting us in a stroller. And then he said he's going to put me in the stroller because I turned down a fight with him. And I'm like, you know, I'm like trying to figure out, like, when did I turn down a fight with you? You know, and he's like, oh, you turned out to fight with me April 18th. So I'm kind of upset. Like, bro, we just shook hands. We just had a good man to man conversation. And then you're going to go and you're going to do some like weird shit on Instagram. You know what I mean? Like, a little, you know what I mean? So I was like, all right, that's, that's, that's where I say the cat part. You know what I mean? Cause you, you had anything to say. You could have just said it to my face. You know what I mean? You're right there. And then Snake, because 
once again, you shook my hand and then you went upstairs and you did that. So it's like, I don't know, I just feel disrespected as a man. And then you came down in the lobby after I won the fight and you're like trying to touch me and ask me if I'm healthy and stuff. And it's like, bro, I, I told you, you know what I mean? I told the whole organization, we can run two fights one night or you can let me fight Wednesday and you can let me fight, you can let me fight Saturday. You know what I mean? Like I left the fight with no injuries. You know what I mean? I didn't get hit. I was, I knew what I was coming to do. You know what I mean? I was coming to collect the check. I was on some Donald Cerrone type stuff. I was cowboy. You know what I mean? Let's get you up to Z-Ha. Let's go. Whatever the case was going to be. And uh, I was ready. You know what I mean? I liked it the way it was going to go, but it didn't happen like that. So we'll see. You know, I still want Marvin Vittori. So it seems like Vittori, from, from everything that I've heard, Vittori and Roberson looks like they're going to run that one back at a later yeah, date. Makes sense. You know, it makes sense. But, you know, if something happens where Mickey Gall just happens where he just he's too scared to fight or he has, you know, something going on, you know what I mean? I don't know. You know what I mean? I haven't heard nothing back yet. You know, as far as I'm concerned, I called him out in the cage. You know, I'm pretty sure he was watching the fights. So I thought I'd get a tweet right then and there or something. You know what I mean? It's like, can't do that, you know? I mean, I mean, I'm already ready for 185. You know what I mean? Can uh, can Marvin Vittori cut weight in two weeks again? You know what I mean? I don't know. He was drinking in the lobby. You know what I mean? Maybe his body can't handle it. He was trying to fight at 205. You know, and it was like it was weird. You know what I mean? It's like you could have you could have campaigned hard for me that day, but instead you're campaigning hard for Neil Magny at, at 205. When he's a, a 170 pound guy. It's like cat. <laughs> Did the did has the UFC expressed interest in the golf fight? Have they approached you with it, it, it for that date, or just kind of going by the call out on Saturday? I mean, I kind of you know called them out for a reason, you know. So, I mean, I would like that fight. I think they would like that fight. It's just a matter of whether Gall's gonna take the fight or not. Because you know, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, I ain't heard nothing yet. So, I mean, like I said, if it was me, I was watching the fight. Somebody said my name, I'd have been like, hey, tweet him. I don't I don't run my Twitter, so I'd have told my manager, I'm like, hey, tweet him, let him know. Like, you know what I mean? I want to fight, but I ain't seen that yet. So, so you're just waiting. Kind you're verbally agreed on your side, just waiting yeah. on an agreement from his side. What kind of questioning the boy? You know what I mean? Let me know if I got to eat salads or if I can go ahead and eat steak. You know what I mean? Just let me know. <laughs> have you been impressed with what he's done? I mean, he's had some ups and downs. He's he's a young guy. He doesn't have the experience that you have, but you know, he's he's gone through the ringer. He's trying to to learn and get better in this game, like you are. What have you made of what he's been able to do so far in his career? I mean, props to him. He's fighting in the UFC. It's the toughest organization in the room. You know what I mean? It's like a lot of my fights are outside the UFC. So it's like, you know, it's just, I guess we could just calculate what we've done to opponents that are in the UFC or what we've done in the UFC. So up and down just as well as him. You know what I mean? It's like his wins are based off submissions. My losses are based off of submissions and people trying to hunt me usually. So it's like, I think it's a good fight for him, and I think it's a good fight for me as well to test myself. And at the same time, let's be honest, I'm light years ahead of him in the stand-up. So it's like, he's going to have to shoot. He's going to have to die for the legs. You know what I mean? And I respect that because I know that's what he's coming into. So take the freaking fight, boy. <laughs> so as we're recording right now, on a scale of 1 to 10, how confident are you that you'll be fighting on May 30th? I'm 50-50 right now. I'm 50-50 right now. You know, I mean, maybe May 30th, maybe the week after, if there's a fight card the week after, you know, I mean, maybe tomorrow at the gym, if Marvin Vittori wants a plane ticket out here, I'll pay for it. You know what I mean? It's like, who knows? You know, I want smoke. I know that much. I want to fight. Speaking of checks, no offense to anyone else who got bonuses on Saturday night, but you got the quickest finish of the night. Were you pissed that you didn't get an extra 50,000 bucks? No, because we were talking about fighting again in two weeks. So I was like, hey, if I get to fight again in two weeks, you know what I mean? Or two to three weeks, 50K, I ain't worried about it. You know what I mean? That's a new contract. You know what I mean? That's that's a, a bigger name. That's a, a better spot in my life. I mean, 50K is nice, but it's not just about the money. You know what I mean? It, I really, really like the fight. So 50K would have been nice. I could help grandma and pop move out here. You know what I mean? Try to get him a house, but... I mean, 50K ain't just enough for a house. I'd have had to get 50K two times in a row. So maybe if they gave me 50K for that fight, then I can go do what I'm about to do again. And then, you know what I mean? Two 50Ks in a row, that'd have been, you know what I mean? That'd have been nice. Yeah, that'd have been nice, but it's all right. You're cool with it? <laughs> yeah. So perfect world. You get back in a few weeks. Let's mm -hmm. do this thing. Let's get right back on the horse. And uh, 
you know, as you know, and it's only been one fight, but momentum is a big thing in this sport, as you know, and you seem to have it right now coming off that big win over Anthony Hernandez. I appreciate you giving us so much time, Kevin. Anything else you want to get off your chest before we wrap this up, sir? Any shout outs or anything like that? You know what? I'm not going to do all that because my phone, you know, I keep doing the tilt thing, but I'm going to say this right here, right now. I'm going to get my own Skype and I'm <laughs> going to get me a laptop and I'm going to get me a little platform where we can set the laptop up and we're going to have a little, we ain't going to be, you know, we ain't going to, we ain't going to be worried about that no more. See what I'm saying? I messed it all up. We ain't going to be worried about that no more. I got <laughs> it. Next time we'll get this right. All right, man. And we, hopefully I can be the first one. We can knock this thing out like the, man, like I, the good old I'm days. i have Orrin text you as soon as I get a laptop. There you go. I love I love your attitude right now. Man. Congratulations on the win, Kevin. Thank you for the time. Hopefully you get that fight with Mickey Gall. I would actually uh, be very interested to see how that one would play yeah, out. So thank Mickey you for the time. Take the fight so I can get a laptop. <laughs> I'll text him right now. <laughs> Thanks, boss. Thanks, man. Take care. There he is, Kevin Holland, the trailblazer himself. And let me just say, the man can talk. You know that already. But I've been interviewing Kevin Holland for a while now, and that's a very focused Kevin Holland. Not saying the guy who came into the UFC on short notice, short notice, excuse me, against Tiago Santos wasn't focused, but that was my big takeaway. This guy doesn't just want to win fights, doesn't want to just be entertaining in the cage and on the mic. He wants to make a big move in 2020 and a little update. I'm not sure as we record if this has been officially announced yet. Maybe it has by the time you hear this, but I'm comfortable enough to say that per sources, and you might be disappointed that I can't give you all of it, but he's got to get the, 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 the quick turnaround that he asked for, but it's not going to be against either of the two gentlemen that he referenced and called out in that conversation. That information, from what I am told, is going to be revealed very, very soon. So expect Kevin Holland to bounce back rather quickly just like he wanted. As we move ahead to the number two ranked contender at 170 pounds in the UFC, he makes a little history here on what the heck, not because it's his second appearance on the show, that's part of it, but because he had a lot to get off his chest. So here it is, my conversation with Colby Chaos Covington. All right, we move ahead to the first fighter to make multiple appearances on What the Heck. He joined us for episode two, and now Chaos has returned to the program. Let us check in with Colby Chaos Covington after a crazy week of fights in Jacksonville. Colby, thanks for doing this. How are you, sir? I'm doing great, man. Can't ever complain, man. Living the American dream. Just uh, thankful for everything I have and, and everything that's coming my way in the future. Well, we, we know you had your opinions on how these fights might go over the last week with videos you posted leading in, which are just something else to, to watch, by the way. But how did you do at the virtual betting window, so to speak, during the, the trio of events in the Sunshine State? I did pretty well, you know. I, I definitely made some money. You know, not all my picks. I mean, not all the, the picks that I publicized and put out there on social media won every bet. But, hey. I'm not supposed to be the best picker in the world, Mike. I'm the best fighter in the world, so I'm sorry. I can't be the, you know, I'm trying to be the best at multiple things in the world, but that is unpredictable. Anything can happen. So, you know, I just want to apologize to the people that that I steer wrong and, and didn't give the right answer to. And, and you know, anything can happen in a fight, you know, that's as real as it gets. And, uh, you know, it's okay because we're going to get some Trump bucks soon and, and Trump's going to send us out another stimulus check and we're all going to be gravy. There you go. But you made a couple bucks of the betting window, so that's all that matters. But uh, I'm curious, were, were there any performances in particular that stood out to you? Like, of course, Justin Gaethje became the interim lightweight champion after defeating Tony Ferguson. That one sticks out in a lot of people's minds. But who would be, I guess, your MVP overall from these three events? Uh, you know, I'm probably the wrong person to ask because I'll be honest, Mike, I, I didn't pay attention to events. You know, I just I had no interest in them. You know, the no fans thing, that's boring enough as it is. And None of the fighters, you know, excited me for the fights. Of course, I'm going to make, you know, some predictions, you know, for my betting website that I'm sponsored by, but mybookie.ag. Thanks to the best, uh, undisputed best sports book in the world, mybookie.ag. Shout out to them and, and how it's their clothing, you know. They're, they're doing good things for the troops and our heroes of America. So big shout out to them as well. When you were last on here, you said that, you know, you wanted to be the guy, the, the guy to bring sports back in everyone's life. So as these fights cards are being booked, is there a part of you that's like, damn, like this should have been my spot. This is my place to bring the sport back. Yeah, it, it was my opportunity to bring the sports back, the sports world back. But, you know, Dana White and the UFC dropped the ball. 
they know if they handed me the ball, you know, I'm running into the end zone, I'm getting a touchdown, but you know, they're afraid to give me the ball, but you know, that's why they're not getting the type of results that they want. You know, if they, if they really want to make the biggest fights possible, then I have to be in them, you know, and I, I need to be at the top of the marquee. And if, if it's not there, then, you know, the fans aren't going to be interested in it, you know, and you need to give the, the fans what they want and, and are begging for, you know, even all my haters, the people that don't want to see it, you know, they still want to see me lose, but it's never going to happen again, especially under a level playing field without Mark Nussel Goddard in there, who's anti-Brexit and a liberal little cuck. And he cheated me out of a world title. So next time it's going to be completely different. You haven't seen the, the best of me yet, Mike. I'm, I'm still 32 years young. I'm not going anywhere anytime soon. So Marty Fake Newsman, he can, he can keep ducking me as long as he wants. I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to be right here. And I guarantee there's going to be a sequel. There's going to be a trilogy to that fight. You know, and last time I was on here, we were talking about Drew McIntyre. You know, Mike, now you, you signed a man's death certificate. You know, I mean, now you're going to have to get Drew McIntyre's blood on your hands. Because now he's talking all crazy out there like he wants to fight in an unsanctioned fight. I'm not afraid of a fight, man. I love to fight, you know. So, you know, usually, it, you know, it's a, the world is a strange place right now, Mike. You know, usually I can find anybody whenever I want. Just ask Dana White. But the world's a strange place. So I'm having a hard time finding Drew McIntyre. I'm going to find him soon. You know, the only person that I've never been able to find is Tyron Woodley. He's out there, you know, just completely ducking me, having midlife crises on Twitter. He's over in the corner begging for change from the UFC. He'll fight anybody, you know, so he's going to fight a guy named Dilbert. So l l let me ask you this, because there's a lot to unpack there, Colby. You, a lot a lot to get into, but let's let's start with Woodley and let's start with the UFC. You said the UFC dropped the ball because you told me a month and a half or so ago that you wanted that fight with Woodley. You wanted it bad or you would have taken the rematch with Kamara Usman. And obviously, like you just mentioned, Woodley is slated to fight Gilbert Burns on May 30th in the main event of that card. So you and Woodley, I, I still don't understand how this fight hasn't come together. It's the fight everybody wants to see. He's come out and said that you've wanted upwards of $5 million to take that fight. So what happened? Why did we not get this fight? Uh, you know, to be honest, Mike, the real reason we didn't get this fight is because the UFC didn't want to give him the fight. You know, the thing is, is his last fight, he looks so washed up, Mike. The UFC wants to see if he has anything left in the tank, you know, so they want to see if he can prove himself to earn the losing ass whooping paycheck to me. So, you know, this is a test by the UFC that, you know, they're making him fight some kid named Dilbert. You know, no one even knows who Dilbert is. So, you know, we'll see if he passes that test and he can earn this this ass whooping losing paycheck to me. But, you know, who knows, man? I mean, he's doing a lot of things out there. You know, he's trying to rap. I mean, he's hurting people's ears, dude. He's a freaking dork. Were we close at all? On this like second go around, were we close at like using a baseball analogy? Were we even rounding seconds at all? Were we close at all? Yeah, we were very close. I, I thought we had the main event. When Khabib and Tony Ferguson fell through, I thought for sure 100% I was going to be the main event. But then that date got scrapped, and they moved it to three weeks later to Jacksonville, and then they inserted Justin Gagey, you know, with Tony Ferguson because they wanted to keep him there. So, you know, after that happened, you know, and they, they already had their other main events for the other two cards, I don't know what happened. You know, I, all I know is we're still in negotiations with the UFC you know, they're talking to my agency, uh, Balanji Group and, and Lloyd Pearson, super manager. So, you know, the, I know, I know they're trying to get a deal done, but they know I want the biggest fights possible, Mike. I earned that and I deserve that, you know. So anything less would be a disappointment and, and I'm not and I'm not wasting my time. Is it fair? Would you say that the Woodley ship has sailed at this point or do you still want that fight? I mean, I know it's like a personal thing for you, but if you're looking for the biggest fights possible and. You know, it doesn't seem like you, you're looking very fondly upon Gilbert Burns right now. Would you say that ship has sailed and you're moving on at this point? Uh, you know, it's it's a long heated rivalry. You know, it sucks that it was never made before. I think the, the UFC really dropped the ball with it. You know, it was a big fight. You know, the you got, you know, the, the left and the right. You know, you got you got uh, red and blue, you know, liberal versus Republican. I mean, everything, you know, the, the backstory of, of us both training at ATT together and, and uh you know, having a history together, you know, him flying me out to training camps to beat him up before he got beat up by Roy McDonald. So, you know, it's, it just sucks, you know, but he never wanted to fight me, man. I'm the first guy to ever scare the champion into elective surgery, elective surgery, Mike. The guy was ready to fight Nate Diaz, some lightweight scrub wash up, you know, we know he's the Stockton soy boy. He was ready to fight him, 
But he won't fight Kobe Chaos Covington when I had the, the real welterweight championship, the people's championship, America's championship. More importantly, Donald Trump's favorite fighter. So, you know, Tyrone Woodley doesn't want to fight, and, and the people know that. And, you know, we're moving on from that. Did you see uh, – I, I know you, you said you didn't really watch the fight. You weren't all that interested in him. But did you see the uh, the appearance of, of the president at the beginning of the UFC 249 prelims on ESPN? Uh, no, man. I, I honestly didn't watch the fights at all. You know, I was I was busy hanging out with chicks, you know, enjoying life, you know, living live the mansion uh, uh, party life, you know. So, you know, I'm out enjoying my life. I don't got time to watch, you know, a bunch of – uh, uh, gatekeepers in the UFC that don't draw and nobody cares about, you know, it's, it's so, you know, but you know, if we're talking about our great president, I would have definitely tuned in if I would have known he was going to be on, you know, just the things he's doing for this country are unbelievable during this time, you know, and, and, uh, he's done everything he said he was going to do. And now, now he's exposed in freaking Obama for being the corrupt, you know, last president in office and, and maybe the most corrupt president ever in office. So, Obamagate, Obamagate. In these crazy times, nothing is set in stone, right? Like, especially now, because it seemed like all paths were leading towards a fight between two of your good buddies, Kamara Usman and Jorge Mazadal for the welterweight title. And Dana White said in an interview with Brett Okamoto that he may have, quote, something else interesting for Mazadal. So, we don't really know what the hell's going on right now. But my question is from your perspective, do you factor into this equation at all? Everybody knows I factor into every equation. I mean, uh, I'm the biggest draw in the division. I made this division great again. You know, those guys, those guys are both wash ups. They're scrubs. No one, no one cares about them because they're fake. They're, their personalities are, you know, they try and act like good guys in the camera, but really behind the camera, they're, they're pieces of shit. You know, they're cheaters, they're liars, you know, they're just, they're not good people, but you know, Let's be honest, Mike. You remember at the Super Bowl when they, they tried to manufacture that fake hype? They, like, pushed each other at the Super Bowl. Oh, come on. What is that, in February? If they wanted to fight, they would have fight, fought, Mike. Let's be honest. That was February. What, February, March, April, May. That's four months. You're telling me all that manufactured hype, oh, we're going to fight each other. Marty Fake Newsman versus Street Judas Mosvidal for the world title, which everybody knows is the fake title. It's the paper title. It's... It's, you know, it's the corrupt title because I was cheated out of the real title and everybody knows I'm the real champ. So if they wanted to fight, they would have fought, Mike, but they don't want to fight. You know, Marty's looking for that easy payday. I don't blame him. Keep, keep looking, you know, but Street Judas Masvidal thinks he's he's the hottest thing since sliced bread in the UFC. Dude, you're 50 50, man. You're, you're a journeyman. You're getting you're getting upside down triangle by guys named Toby Imada, beaten up by Babu, beaten up by lightweights, beaten up by by featherweights, bantamweights. I mean, the guy's got like 15 losses. He's a journeyman, dude. He's got you know it's it's pathetic that that he even claims to be one of the best fighters in the world. I mean, he was just getting beat up by Damian Maya, Stephen Wondergirl Thompson less than a couple of years ago. I mean, so you know he doesn't want to fight. He's he's waiting for Conor McGregor and. Conor McGregor doesn't give a shit about him. I mean, you saw with Conor at the fight when he beat up Cerrone, he would have called George out. He was front row in his little bathing suit, freaking his little bathing robe. Oh, I'm in my Gucci bathing robe, rub, I'm, or bathing suit, or bath rub, or whatever the fuck he was wearing. But it's a cool fucking gimmick, dude. Journeyman George Masvidal hit lightning in a bottle, and he's trying to capitalize right now. And, and to be honest, you know, he's not going to capitalize because he dropped the ball on the, on the Marty Fake Newsman fight, and Connor doesn't want to fight him, so who's going to fight Journeyman? Are, are, would you be interested in the Mazadal fight right now? Because obviously there's some there's some heat here. Um, is, is that a fight that's on your list? Like I know Usman's probably at the top of your list right now. You really want that rematch, but is, does Mazadal make that short list for you? A hundred percent. Me and Street Judas Mazadal are a hundred percent going to fight before it's all said and done. We we might fight a couple times because if I see him in the street, it's going to be a fade session. He's going to get put on the concrete. I'm going to drop him on his fucking head and put stitches in the back of his head. And it's not going to be nice, Mike. I promise you that. And, and he knows that. Deep down inside, he knows. But he's willing to take a paycheck in the UFC to get his ass whooped because he knows the UFC is going to pay his fucking medical bills. But besides that, if, he, if, if we fight in the street, I'm going to drop him on his fucking head and he's never going to be the same person again. Because he's going to be concussed. The concrete's going to mess with him. And I'll probably kick his teeth in, too, while I'm at it. Just because he's a piece of shit. I mean, I mean, the guy's claiming – I mean, he's the sucker punch king. You know, he's claiming for being out at Denny's 
and being the dine and dash king. Dude, you're a piece of shit, man. You're dining and dashing on single mothers that are working at Denny's because you know they're trying to put food on the table for their child and, you, and you're, you're bragging about being proud of dining and dashing on them? Dude, the guy's the lowest scum denominator of earth. And he's the fakest piece of shit. He turned his back on me for money and his management team. And, and people are going to find out the real truth about him. I mean, he's going to get exposed soon. I know so much about him. And, and, and it doesn't make sense to come out yet. When we fight, it'll all be built up in the fight. But until then, dude, he's just going to keep being that like, fake piece of shit. And he's going to keep fucking disobeying commands from, you know, ATT chief Dan Lambert and freaking, you know, trying to go above his word like he's better than, than Dan, Lambert, Dan Lambert's word. Very interesting because, you know, let's put it this way. A rematch with Usman, title fight, clearly very lucrative. It's a fight you want. You want to get that one back. But Mazadal has become a big star over the last year, whether you, you know, no matter how you look at it, he has become a, a, a very big name in the sport. And that can be very lucrative as well. So let's just say all things are even here. Money, all of that. If the UFC called you right now and said, Colby, money's the same. What comes next will be the same in terms of your financial future. What have you? You know, from the from just like a fight component standing by itself, what do you want more, Usman or Mazadal? I want them both in the same night, Mike. That's how pissed off. I, you know, I have such a bad, salty taste in my mouth from my last fight with Marty Fake Newsman just getting cheated by Mark Not So Goddard. Just all the fake fouls and the fouls that did happen. He doesn't call and the the bullshit early stoppage when I was clearly still in the fight and intelligently defending myself. So, you know, we're gonna run that back. There's gonna be a sequel and trilogy with Marty Fake Newsman. But my ex-best friend, Street Judas Masvidal, he has a special ass whooping waiting for him. He's for sure going to get – he's talking about me getting my jaw wired shut. Bitch, I never got one thing fucking jaw, uh, wired shut on my fucking mouth. Never got shit. But when we fight, I promise you, Street Judas, your teeth will be wired shut. I'm going to fucking take you down. I'm going to fucking slice you up with my elbows, and I'm going to break your fucking face with these fucking knuckles. Mark my words, Mike. So if the UFC offers you either of those fights, you're jumping on it. Jumping on it. My agency, Lloyd Pearson, is signing the paper before the ink can dry. Those are the only fights I want, the biggest fights possible. And the people are going to be fucking super satisfied when they see Colby Chaos Covington version 2.0. I was playing before, Mike. Now I'm fucking serious. I'm not fucking playing around anymore. Now you got you get so many options right now. That's that's what happens. Usman Mazadal, and you mentioned Drew McIntyre. This thing just took off like a like a rocket ship. You said, you know, and it started with you just saying that I want to, you know, I think I'm going to be in the WWE the summer of 2021, and then it's become this whole thing where Drew talks to ESPN and says that he's going to smash your head in, that he's going to shut you up, and he's going to break your jaw like Usman did. He said he'd fight you anywhere in a bar, or whatever. But this took off so quickly. Can you be, like? Are you surprised that? that Drew reacted to this the way that he did? I'm not surprised, you know. He, he sees the way I draw, you know. I, I'm the king of the UFC right now, you know. I'm the, I'm the most controversial and talked about fighter. Everybody, everybody can't keep my name out of their mouth, you know. I'm living rent-free in every fighter's head. Everybody talks about me and everybody wants to be me. So, you know, the thing with the WWE is everybody thinks that I'm just going to leave the UFC and go over the WWE. No, nah, I can do both at the same time. I'm still young. I'm 32 years young. I'm not even in my prime yet. I'm still getting better every single day, stronger every day, better cardio. And everybody knows how good my cardio is. They call me the cardio king for a reason. So I want to do both at the same time. I want to go whoop Drew McIntyre's ass in an unsanctioned fight, maybe over in Saudi Arabia, maybe in his home country of, of Scotland. And I want to go whoop Marty Fake Newsman's ass and Street Judas Masvidal's ass. And nothing's changing. It's going to happen. Everybody knows I'm a man of my word. Promises made, promises kept, just like Mr. President says. Have you been approached by WWE at all with all this going on? Uh, you know, I haven't been approached like directly by them, but you know, I know they know who I am and I know that there's some rumblings and, and some talkings behind the scenes. So I'll leave that up to my management group. You know, I'm just worried about getting better every day, training hard, you know, working on my wrestling moves, working on my fighting moves, just just evolving. You know, I love the process. Everybody knows that. I trust the process and I've always loved the process. I'm not afraid of hard work. You know, I'm a, I'm a blue collared American that, you know, is living the American dream and I had nothing given to me. I had to earn it the hard way, you know, just like the troops are doing it, you know, they're earning it the hard way every day and they're putting, they're sacrificing their lives for our freedoms, you know, 
Those guys inspire me. That's who I fight for, the troops and the Trumps. You have to think that uh, all this with Drew put you on their radar a little bit more, I would say. But uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't get your take on something because you are tied to both of these individuals. Have you seen this back and forth on social media between your fellow Oregonian, Chael Sonnen, and your old buddy, John Jones? Have you seen that? And if so, what have you made of this whole thing? No, I haven't really paid attention to that, man. I, I've been, I mean, it, it, as you can see on Twitter, you know, I'm not, I'm not on Twitter a lot. You know, I go on there occasionally when I want to set up business and, and, and I want people to, to, to talk about that business. But other than that, you know, I don't got time to be on social media. You know, I'm not like most of these fighters. Most of these fighters are looking at every down, every comment. Oh, what does this person say? They're looking up in their feelings. You know, that's why they're the ultimate feelings champions looking down every comment, every engagement, this and that. I'm out getting better. I'm out working hard. I'm out trying to make my fans happy, trying to make my family happy, trying to work hard for my legacy, for my future. You know, so I have a lot of unfinished business, you know, with Marty Fake Newsman, with Street Jewish Masvidal. So until I take care of that unfinished business, I'm not going to be satisfied, Mike. So I need to stay on the grind, keep working hard every single day and earning it every single day. Just like the American, you know, just like every other American. Last thing for me, Colby, and I appreciate the time. Perfect world. And we know how much tougher that scenario is these days. When do we see you back? When will we hear the Kurt Angle theme song once again as you walk down the aisle into that octagon to compete again? Yeah, you know, I, I've been ready since December, so I would love to come back soon. You know, that that ball is in, in UFC's court. You know, that's that's what they need to they need to get the negotiations right and, and we need to get a deal done. We're very close and and you know, we need to we need to get this done, you know. We need to get back in into business and, and let me do my thing, man. Give me the football. Uh, if you give me the ball, I'm running a touchdown UFC. I guarantee that. I'm on the I'm the best I've ever been, and I'm getting better every single day. So anybody that doubts me will be proven wrong very soon. But in a perfect world, you know, by June or July, I'll be back in the octagon on Fight Island or or coaching tough or in Vegas at the apex, it doesn't matter. I just want to put on a show for the people and save the sports world. Cause all these other guys, they're just boring, man. And nobody cares about them. Coach and tough. Has that been, has that been brought up at all? Cause I know Dana said he's going to bring it back. People thought it was dead. Is, is, is that a possibility here? I think anything's a possibility. You know, I think to shoot for the stars always, you know, and, and, and it's better than shooting for, you know, the sun. Then you land in a pile of shit. <laughs> <laughs> what a prof I was going to say, what a professional answer, but then you turned it on me. So nicely done, <laughs> Colby. We made history here. First fighter guest to appear on the show multiple times. And it was, uh, it was great catching up with you as always, Colby. You and I have been chatting and doing this thing for years now. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, I gotta say, honestly, people can look at you however you want, but however they want and whatever lens they want to. But for me, as somebody who, who's been covering this sport, you're one of the few guys who early on gave me the chance. And I think, uh, so to see you kind of get up there and, and headline cards and fight for titles and, and be an interim champion and all this stuff, it's, it's, it's pretty surreal. I gotta be honest with you seeing that it's, it's kind of one of those things you appreciate as a journalist and we have to be biased and all that stuff, but still like, you, you gotta be a human being too. And just be like, wow, that's, that's pretty cool. Absolutely, man. It's, it's crazy journey we've been, we've been on, you know, we've been at a while and we never gave up, you know, a lot of people give up before they could get to that, that good opportunity and they throw in the towel, but you know, we both kept working hard and now we get to do what we love and, and we're just getting started, man. The best is yet to come. There you go, Colby. I appreciate the time very much. Hopefully we get to see you back in June or July and uh, all the best to you during these crazy times. And we'll talk soon. Talk soon, Mike. Take care, brother. Stay safe. How about that? The former UFC interim welterweight champion, and he certainly was not messing around this week. Colby Covington. I mean, just think about that conversation. Woodley, Usman, Mazudal, Drew freaking McIntyre, the WWE champion, the UFC themselves. He took a shot at everybody there. And it's really interesting. It, it will be really interesting, mind you, to see what happens next for Colby Covington. Because there are some potential options for him. And... I'm just going to throw this out there. If Tyron Woodley beats Gilbert Burns next weekend, and that's a big if because Gilbert Burns has been on a roll, you have to make that fight between Woodley and Covington. Like, enough is enough. Whatever it takes, get it done. There is still life there, and that is kind of rare in this book because a lot of times where, you know, direction-wise, two paths are about to, to lead into a collision with each other, and for some reason, the fight doesn't get done. Something happens when things get mixed around and changed around, 
and then we never get to see it. But there is still life here, even after Colby Covington lost, even after Tyron Woodley lost, and they both lost to Kamara Usman. But you need to capitalize on it, and you need to do it soon. But, of course, Gilbert Burns is going to have something to say about that in a very interesting main event next Saturday in, I believe, Las Vegas. Not 100% on that, but that's what Dana White said as we move ahead to our final guest of the program. He returned to the UFC last Wednesday night on super short notice to take on UFC debutante Ike Villanueva. And we saw a much different fighter than we saw in his first stint with the promotion. No doubt about that. Let us check in with the gift king himself, the vanilla gorilla. Here he is, Jay Sherman. All right, we move ahead to another one of the big winners during the Jacksonville trifecta for the UFC. Chase Sherman kicked off the card last Wednesday night, picked up a second-round TKO win over Ike Villanueva to kick off that card, a triumphant return for the Vanilla Gorilla, and he joins us right now. Chase, how are you, man? I'm good, man. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Congratulations on the win. You're back in the UFC. You go in there and get a finish. Now that you've had some time to sort of let it all sink in, how does it all feel? Uh, it feels good, you know. I rode, I rode that high for about two or three days, and now I'm, uh, you know, back to normal life. You know, Wednesday night I was putting out people's lights, and then Sunday morning I was putting out people's fires. So we're back to normal life, back to work, and um, you know, trying to get back in the gym and you know get a normal routine going. One of the misconceptions that, that I saw on social media heading into the fight is that when you were released from the UFC, people thought you just sort of vanished off the face of the earth, but you were extremely active, not just on the bare knuckle scene, which people saw, but you were active in MMA as well. You had three first round finishes for island fights to set you up for this call. So to sort of go back in the book a little ways, when you lost that fight to Augusto Sakai in September of 2018 and you were subsequently released... How did you react to all that? Because it certainly seemed to to flip a switch in you. Well, at first, you know, I was kind of embarrassed. I kind of wanted to wash my hands uh, with it. Um, I always told myself, you know, if I didn't, if I didn't uh, make a good go of it in the first go round in the UFC, I, and I got cut, like I was done. I wasn't going to go back to the regional scene and try to fight to get back on. And I was going to try to figure something else out to do. And <clears throat> And uh, so it happened, and I was just like, you know, it's time to figure something else, get get a new niche, find something else I enjoy, um, find a new way to make money. And um, a month or two started passing by, and I was just like, I can't, I can't just, I can't leave a stone unturned, you know what I mean? I have unfinished business. And um, I still had that competitive drive in me, and I knew that there was, there was something left on the table. And um, – I just caught and called him in. Like I couldn't, you know, call the in like that. You know? So I, uh, you know, Dean had, Dean had already messaged me. Sorry, Dean had already messaged me um, about a fight that uh, September or that December. I got released in September, um, and um, I was like, "Yeah, Dean, I, I really, I really ain't feeling it." You know what I mean? I, no, nobody knows I've been released from the UFC just yet, and I just don't want people in my business and. Um, and, uh, you know, I live in a small town. Everybody knows everybody. So I, it's kind of embarrassing to me, you know, knowing that I, got, I lost my job. And uh, but after a while, I was just like, you know, I, I got to I got to do something. I can't just I just can't go by like this. And, uh, we went on and um, we got we rounded off three wins and um, then the bare knuckle started. So do you remember the moment where you were just like, you know what, I'm I'm, I'm going to do this? Like you, you talked about the road, you got that competitive drive. But do you remember the moment where you're like, okay, I'm back? Like, like that switch flip for you that to get back in the gym and start preparing for another fight? Um, yeah, I mean, it just really kind of happened. Um, it really happened after after the after the win. You know, I just needed to get that win back under me and get that feeling. You know, and, and um, I just had to get better, man. You know, I had to get better, and I had to um, get back to enjoying the process. Um, you know, if all you enjoy, if the only thing you're chasing is wins and that's the only thing you enjoy about it, you're not going to really have a great career because, you know, there's not everybody's going to win every fight. You know what I mean? You got to enjoy the process, the grind just as much as anything. And, um, I had to get back to doing that and enjoy actually training and, and, um, things of that nature. 
Did you feel like towards the the latter part of your first UFC run that you were starting to, I guess, fall out of love with the sport? You know, obviously getting in the cage and fighting is there's a different feeling that goes through you. But, you know, the preparation and stuff like you talked about, did you feel like you had uh, had fallen out of love with it a little bit? Well, I just got to the point to where it was um, repetitive a little bit, you know, and um, and and really what it was, man, it was it was a lot of it was nerves. Um, the first go round, I, I kind of told myself, um, you know, this was my career and, and I have to win. I can't lose. Or, you know, if I get cut, like, what am I going to do? And, um, and, and I would go into fight week and I would just be so ate up with, you know, nerves and, and emotion that I just, could, I didn't even enjoy it. I wasn't having fun. It was miserable. Um, I was going to all these beautiful cities and in different countries that I've never been and would never get to go to again, probably. And I wasn't even getting to, to draw on the whole experience and um, and uh, really taking the fact that I'm doing something that most people aren't going to ever be able to do and uh, and getting paid to do it. And so, like, I just didn't enjoy the process, man. I'd stay in my room and I wouldn't eat all week and um, – you know, like I said, I was just so scared of losing that, you know, I forgot what was important, which was having fun. So I kind of flipped the switch on that going into this time because I just got the call out of nowhere. I wasn't expecting it. And I was like, wow, man, I'm truly totally blessed. Like, I'm going to soak this up because I don't know. I, will, I don't know if I'll get another opportunity. And that's what it that's what it is. It's not a career. It's an opportunity. Every chance is an opportunity. You don't know when you're going to be cut. You don't know when you're going to be released. You don't know when you're going to get injured. Um so this isn't a career. It's just an opportunity. You win, you get another opportunity. And so that's how I kind of approached the situation. And I went out there and I just was like, I'm going to have fun. I'm going to let loose and, 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 and let my hands go. And I'm going to do, I know I'm going to do what I know I'm capable of doing. And um, I think you saw a little bit of what I'm capable of doing on a fucking six days notice. So I, you know, I think a lot of things we do, man, we're, it's all here. It's mental. You know, we let our own selves get in the way. With that, you you made a lot of different changes because uh, I saw I, I believe you're a you're a certified exercise physiologist now. Like you said, you're a firefighter in Gulfport, Mississippi, as of last summer. So you've been extremely busy outside of the fight game as well. And and I know that with me, I love being busy and diving into different things because it keeps me sharp and and you know helps me focus on individual tasks by diving into others. If that makes any sense. But how much has diving into all these different things and taking these new avenues helped you grow as a, as a person along with being the fighter. Yeah. I always try to have my hands in different pots. Um, I've always kind of been like that. And, um, you know, uh, I'll pick up new little things, uh, uh, little hobbies every now and then, and I'll, I get super obsessed with something. Um, and then a couple months later I'll find something else and I'll get super obsessed with it. And, um, you know, like when hunting season rolled around, I just got super obsessed with hunting. Like that's all I was doing every day on the side was just worrying about going deer hunting and then watching videos and bond guns and, you know, all kinds of stuff and gear. And then when fishing season rolled around, that's all I cared about was going and catch, go wade fishing. You know, every morning I'd wake up and check the tides and I'd go down to the beach and go wade fish out there right before I'd go into work. And then I'd get off from the station and go fish again. And, um, and then it was, you know, working on my Harley. You know, I was just getting so obsessed with like fixing it up and, and doing all that. And then and then now I've kind of dabbled into, you know, into uh, firearms. So um, yeah, I just kind of like that. I get, you know, obsessed over things. And then also like I I, I try to do different avenues that might generate some um, some sort of revenue. And you know, like um, you know, I work at the fire station. Um, I'm a strength and conditioning coach. Um, I, um, uh, you know, I'm licensed to sell life insurance. Um, I'm a professional fighter. So I'm trying to do all kinds of different things, you know, but yeah, you know, it keeps my mom busy. I always say idle hands are the devil's playground. So if you're sitting around a lot, it's, you know, not typically good for the mental. I would agree with that. How did you enjoy the, the bare knuckle experience? That's certainly, there's certainly a lot of people out there who feel like bare knuckle is the next big thing in combat sports and others see it differently. But again, this world can be full of misconceptions. What did you take away from that experience and how much of a future does bare knuckle have in terms of growth and popularity in your opinion? Um, you know, 
I don't know, man. I'm, I'm kind of mixed emotions about a lot of things that went on in Bare Knuckle. Um, some things that were, um, in a sense that if you're going to be a, you know, call yourself a top organization and you're going to be the next big thing in the world and, and this and that, um, there was a lack of professionalism in a lot of different avenues and a lot of things that were handled, um, I didn't quite agree with and most people wouldn't agree with. And I'm kind of going to leave it at that. Um, I will say this, the reason I got into Bare Knuckle was because A, it was in the local scene and two, uh, I mean B, I said A and two, um, and B, uh, because uh, they were paying more money than any other kind of regional MMA uh, show around here. So, um, Doing the M- I was doing the MMA to get back into the UFC. It was never about the money, you know. It never, you know, never is um, on the regional scene. You just need to get the wins. So I was doing that to get the wins, to get back in the UFC. And then I was obviously doing the bare knuckle. Um, I was doing the bare knuckle for uh, financial reasons. But I did enjoy it. There was something about it that was really cool. Um, I really enjoy boxing, man. I love the history of boxing. Um, and I love the craft. And I really, I truly believe that, um, that just working, doing the bare knuckle changed a lot in my, of of my game. You know, I grew as a fighter as a whole. So yeah, you know, if I'm glad I did it, I'll just leave it at that. You know, I'm glad I did it. You mentioned that this fight came together very quickly. How did you get the news that you, that you'd be back in the UFC? What was that conversation like? Have you ever met Dean Tool? Have you ever talked to Dean Tool? I talked to him just to set up this interview. It was the first time I've ever spoken with him. Was he professional with you? Very. Was he? Oh, okay. Well, he's not like that with me. We have- <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, anyways, dude, I love that guy. He's dude, he's hilarious. He's taking care of me in so many ways. I mean, I mean that guy. I could just go on about it, but anyways, so I was. Just ready, ready to go train my, my young athletes. Um, and um, he called me and um, he FaceTimed me. And I answered the phone. He's like, what's up? And I was like, what's up, man? And he always does this. So I didn't think it was nothing special. You know what I mean? He's like, what's up? And I was like, what's up? He goes, what you doing? I said, I'm about to go uh, train, train my athletes. And he goes, do you know what today is? I said, it's May 1st. He goes, exactly. I said, okay, what, what's your point? He said, well, what are you going to be doing the next 12 days? And I said, I don't know, probably fucking working. I'm broke like the rest of America. <laughs> you know, I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to pay, you know, my bills from last month and the month coming up, you know. And um, he goes, okay. He said, well, what about, he said, what about your fight? I said, I said, I said what, what fight, Dean? He said, you're not going to be training? I said, what fight are you talking about? I said, you, did you, you know, did you, uh, y'all got a card lined up or something for island fights? That's what I thought it was. He goes, no. I said, what the fuck are you talking about? I was like, I, I got to go train these kids. Like, I ain't sitting on my couch talking bullshit. What you got? He goes, you got to fight uh, May 13th in Jacksonville, Florida. I said, okay, with who? He goes, UFC. I was like, don't fuck with me, man. I'm not, I'm not in the mood. Like, don't be fucking with me. Like, it's not, this ain't the time. You know what I mean? And uh, he's like, I'm dead serious. I said, seriously? He goes, four fight deal. Your son with UFC. He said, you're fighting in Jacksonville, Florida, uh, May 13th. I was like, are you serious? He goes, swear to God. And he starts laughing. I was like, motherfucker. Because, I mean, I I haven't, I didn't have a, a MMA fight all all of uh, this year. I haven't had one. And I don't think I, I don't think I had one last year either. I did have one last year. It was the beginning um uh, of last year but that was it and then i started the bare knuckle you know and so i was like i had to get another more like at least a one more regional scene win before maybe i get some leeway in there i mean they did call for the contender series but i was in the middle of the fire academy so i kind of turned that down but you know uh, uh i had had an mma fight and so um uh, in a minute and um pfl at the time had offered had told us in february told my managers that it, that they were going to uh they were they wanted to bring me in on the, on the for the new season this summer, 
And I was like, all right, cool. That's cool. That's, you know, that's money in the bag. They pay their fighters pretty good, you know? And I said, well, I still like the ultimate goal is to get to the UFC. You know what I mean? Like, that's where I want to be. And, um, and I said, well, let's do this. I said, let me go fight on the regional scene in March. We'll get another win. We'll go talk to Mick Maynard. And then um, we'll say, hey, Mick, you know, he's been offered by PFL, but he wants to sign with you. We got, we're got 4 0 since being released. Uh, you have anything? And he said, if they don't want me, then I'll go and sign with PFL. Well, my opponent in March backed out three days before the fight. So, we're like, fuck, all right. We called PFL up. They said, we're going a different route. We don't want Sherman anymore. Okay, shit. We called Mick up. Mick was like, all right, well, I don't know. Like, you know, like, we'll see. He hasn't fought in a while. And, you know, basically just kind of being nice but saying kind of like, you're wasting my time. You know what I mean? You need some more wins. Um, so, I was like, all right. So, I set up another fight uh, for Kenny Garner uh, here in Biloxi for a, uh, for a title fight on a regional show. And Kenny is former M1 Global heavyweight champ from several years ago. Um, and that was going to be April 11th. Well, this shit happened. And that fight got canceled. So, you know, that's prob- that's a good chunk of change for me going down the drain in the last two months. So I'm just basically working as a fire- firefighter. The gyms are closed. So I'm not able to train any of my clients. Um, I'm just struggling, man, struggling for money. And, uh, and I thought it was like, you know, I- I'm not a very God-fearing man, you know, <laughs> but I'm probably – pretty spiritual person but i'm not super religious you know and i was just like first time i prayed in a while i was like i need some i need some fucking help you know what i mean i need some help something give me a sign or something and it was about a day or so later that um i was just working out in my little homemade gym i have in my garage and me and my buddies were and someone was filming me you know a couple of lifts on facebook or something and my lieutenant at the fire station was like hey will you train my little boys will you, you know will you uh well, you um, work them out. You know, they haven't been able to do nothing. School's closed. They play baseball, football. And I was like, yeah, come on, bring them by. So I put him through a little workout. And he was taking some, he was filming a little bit. And his wife posted it on Facebook. And uh, and literally after she posted it, I like, like 10 moms were like, take my kid. Like, go do something with him. Get him out the damn house. You know, here's my money. Just work them out, you know. I was like, all right, cool. I was like, sure. So I I was like, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I thought that was what my prayers were answered. You know what I mean? I'm like making a, a couple extra hundred bucks a week or whatever. I'm like, thank you. And um, and sure enough, the very next day, I'm, I'm that's when I get the call from Dean. I'm about to go train my kids. What you want? He's like, you're going to the UFC. I'm like, holy fucking shit. So, wow. and then it's just, it's been balls to the wall from there. You know, six days, six days, man. I had before I, before I flew out and I, I, done any training in over a month you know what i mean nope no training in over a month um except for weightlifting you know that was it and um and uh six days to get ready still training my kids it's all left you know what i mean you hear me yeah there you go yeah there you go i was just i was just i didn't want to interrupt you but uh okay okay can you hear me though yep you're perfect all right, uh, so I, you know, I'm doing all the USADA stuff again, and um, I miss all that. I'm trying to find some time to get in there and, and to my coaches who also have lives um, and things going on. I'm, I'm like calling them up and being like, "Hey, look, dude, I got six days. Like, come help me or something," you know. And and, and um, so it was, dude. It's been balls to wall. I haven't stopped. Um, and uh, and then we, you know, we we drove down there, and the rest is history. With it coming together so quickly, like you said, you were you were boss of the wall, just getting to Jacksonville, getting to the fight. Did you even did you know anything about Ikeville in a way? Like obviously, you know he's he's a he's a thirty six year old guy. He finally got his opportunity. This is a huge moment for him. But did you have any time to even look at any footage or learn much about him heading into it? I I watched like film once. Um, my coach watched my 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 striking coach watched once and. And uh, that was about it. And then we was like, um, this is what we see. And this is what we're going to work on because we don't have a lot of time to really de- to devise an intricate game plan. You know what I mean? We have we have to go with – because you know what I mean? We don't have a bunch of time to, all right, we're going to do this. We're going to do this. We're going to do this. If that don't work, we'll do this, this, and this. So we're basically like, okay, let's keep it simple. 
and uh, just re- do repetition, repetition, repetition after that. So that was it. That, you know, that was it. Watched the film, film once. And said this, this should be able to, should be able to work, and we'll go with it from there. You know, so um, and it did. You know, um, and just muscle memory kind of took over. And like I said, the the bare knuckle boxing really helped with me with my hands and my timing and my technique a little bit better as far as like turning over my punches and being more precise. Um, just being a lot smoother instead of just trying to be so fast, you know, and arm punching everything. Um, so it felt a lot different, man. Like I went and, and I went into that. And I was like, damn, I, I was like, I feel like I wasn't, you know, I, I was like, I feel like I wasn't wasting a whole lot of energy or, you know, it was, I felt calm and I feel like I wasn't, you know, landing big shots. And then I went back and watched film and I was like, holy fuck. Like I was like, there was some heat being thrown and I was trying to take that guy's head off. You know, that last elbow, if it would have landed, like probably he might still be in the hospital. I don't know if you've seen that or not, but oh yeah, the Lord blessed him right there. What did you, um, what did you make of the very unique fight week experience during such a crazy time in the world? Like one thing that you said in this conversation that stuck out to me was you wanted to enjoy the process more and enjoy going to the cities. And there was some social media footage of you out training on the beach and stuff. So you got to at least get out and, and do something outside of the hotel. But you know, with the testing and everything, what did you make of the, uh, the fight week experience? Um, really the only, really only the first day was kind of a cluster for me. And it wasn't nothing the UFC did. They had it all rolling pretty smoothly. Um, but just for me, like we we drove there, so we were driving all day, and then well, and then we got there, and um, you know, unpacking all your shit, and then so. But before you could go up to the room and relax, you and before you could check in, you had to get tested. And uh, it was a pretty smooth process, just going in, sign on all, all the paperwork that, that that we normally do on fight week, and then um, kind of wait your turn to get tested. Um, process took maybe 15 minutes with everybody, you know, moving in front of you and stuff. And, um, and got the results and then it was pretty much normal for there. If we, we came downstairs to the, to anywhere, like to go downstairs, we just have to get our temperature taken, taken. Um, and they'd give us a wristband after we were, our temp was taken and we'd be good to go for the rest of the day. So it was pretty simple. You know, it wasn't too big of a deal. Um, you know, uh, yeah, so it was weird, but I mean, we're in strange times right now, man. So I'm not going to complain about anything. I think they did a really good job. The leg kicks were scoring big time in the first round, and you admitted yourself after the fight that you veered away from the game plan a little bit late in that round. Ike was starting to land a little bit. It was starting to turn into a dogfight a little bit. But second round, you came out and you slowed things down a little bit and got the finish early on. What was the conversation like between rounds with your coaches to help sort of snap you back into that more methodical approach? Well, man, I just have, um, you said later in the rounds, I kind of um, have a tendency of uh, when I'm getting like kind of bum rushed or whatever that I, I'll just, you know, lean back and I get caught and then I'll, you know, return two or three. Uh, but, um, I don't know. I just get kind of excited, you know, towards like, I guess towards the end of the round. That's how, that's how I spar too, you know, like I'll be more methodical in the beginning. And then towards the end of the round, the last minute and a half, two minutes, I'm typically trying to pick up the pace and really put it on them. Um, I was trying to put the pressure on them, uh, obviously going into this, to the second round, like wearing them down, break them down a little bit mentally, you know what I mean? And physically as well. Um, so I'll pick up the pace at the end of the first round and then, Hopefully, by you know, go, when he's going to the store, he's like, "Fuck," you know. I kind of had to defend a bombardment right there, you know, exhaust him out a little bit towards the end of the first. But uh, yeah, I do get caught in those exchanges more than I'd like to. Um, but I went to the second, knowing that I needed to just kind of stay in the pocket a little bit more and um, and kind of um, use my guard, you know, shell up a little bit more, and then return the combos versus fading back because he was coming in hard. So I knew if I stood my ground and showed up, he was going to be right in the clinch range and then the elbow range because he, he just coming on a linear path. He's not he wasn't cutting his angles or anything off of his combos. He's coming straight in and then he wasn't even moving out, back out. You know what I mean? So he was coming straight in. So I was like, OK, shell up, put him in the clinch. Boom. I landed the big knee. He came back in again. I faded. him up, faked him out with the knee. I was going to hit him with the knee, let his head slide up. 
boom, hit them with the elbow. And then the one, two, put them up against the fence and then just try to finish them from there. But he was a tough guy, you know. So um, I asked my asked my coaches in between rounds if the leg kicks were working because you never, you know, you don't know really what's going on. You're such in a weird kind of state of mind when you're fighting. You don't know if stuff's landing hard or not. And they were like, do not stop fucking leg kicking him. Do not stop. I was like, okay. And soon enough, sure enough, like, I got off the stool and I looked over there across the ring at his leg and it already had a huge hematoma on him, on his, on his, on his calf. And I was like, and it was bruising. I was like, yeah, you're about to get kicked some more, buddy. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so that was pretty much the game plan. As if the win wasn't enough for you. I'm sure that was a, just an amazing moment to get back in there and, and get the win. I think fans were very excited when they were graced with your return to Twitter after the fight. You referenced your promo afterwards uh, with Daniel Cormier, the ordering 10 chicken wings and getting 11 feeling, which was amazing. Fans are pumped to see the, the the gift king back on Twitter. What was the reason for the for the layoff for I think it was it was almost a year since you were off Twitter? Yeah, well, man, because dude, people are fucking ruthless online. You know what I mean? It's ruthless and it's real I mean I just didn't want that kind of negativity in my life anymore when I already had enough negativity going on. Like I'm getting cut from the UFC and, and I mean, my whole life's changing and I don't want to have to log on to Twitter and see fucking 20,000 people tell me how bad I fucking suck. You know what I mean? A life when they're sitting home on their couch with their thumb up their ass, you know what I mean? And you can't really do nothing about it, you know? So I just didn't want to, I don't have to deal with that anymore. And so, um, I logged off for a while, and um, yeah, that was it. I mean, I just I was done with it. You know what I mean? You posted that. You posted a video of your son watching your fight and cheering you on. And as a dad myself, just uh, an amazing thing to see. How did you react to seeing that video after you got that win? Oh man, I teared up. Man, I was. <laughs> I've watched it a million times. You know, it's shit. They played uh, right before I walked out. They were showing clips from previous fights and one, one where I, uh, I, um, uh, I brought him into the ring and stuff. And, and, um, and I was like, damn, man, like, like right before I walked out, I was like already tearing up. You know what I mean? I seen it and I was like, shit, get emotional. But, um, it was cool. It was cool. Uh, last thing for Lego, I appreciate you giving me so much time, but, uh, it didn't take long for the first post UFC return victory call out to take place against you on Saturday. Rodrigo Nascimento picked up a second round submission win over Dante Mays and called to fight you upon his return to the octagon. Did you hear about that call out? And if so, how did you react to it? Um, uh, yeah, I did. I was, I was, uh, I'm a, I'm a buddy's house. And, um, we was, you know, going to watch the fights, the main card, at least that, uh, Saturday. And, um, we celebrate and I just got back in town from Jacksonville and, um, I rode my, um, my, me and my old lady stayed in, um, Orange Beach, Alabama, and I brought my Harley out there and we rode around and hung out at the beach in the condo and stuff. So I, I drove back home and we started to have some beers and stuff like that. And my cousin was grilling out and they was having a good time. And then, you know, I got the cup, I logged on to Facebook and I see like me getting tagged and all this stuff about being called out. And then I started getting text messages and I'm, I was just like, okay, whatever it is, you know, whatever. And um, and beforehand, you know, back when I was in the UFC before, I'd have been like, you know, like what the fuck, you know, like before I even realized who it was or what was said, I'm already on Twitter, like you know, I'll fight you or whatever, like sign it up. But man, we're taking a different approach to things this this go around, and um, I'm not gonna let my pride get in the way of my legacy. Um, so with that being said is like, we're going, we went and we were studying film and trying to do the things that, you know, we need to do. And I told Mick and those guys, like when we go into this, I'm going to make sure I'm ready. You know what I mean? I haven't done anything in two months and, um, and they wanted me to fight in July. And I'm like, you know, I'm not fighting this guy in July because, where, where's the benefit there? He's a he's a very he's a very skilled fighter. There's no there's no market for it. You know what I mean? He doesn't have much of a name, and it's like what what's the where, where does that benefit me? Where does that benefit my career? 
You know what I mean? You want me to go fight him later in the year? Fine, let's do it. You know what I mean? Let's go. But I want I'm, I'm in July. So what? I have June, basically June to get ready. You know what I mean? And so it's like, no, I'm, I'm not, you know, that's my coach was like, that's not a smart fight. And Andrew's like, that's not a smart fight. So I'm going to listen to them. You know what I mean? I'm not going to let my pride get in the way and go into a knockdown drag out fight and then potentially be one and one. You know what I mean? Then what? You know? And then everybody, as soon as I lose a fight, like, oh, yeah, we knew it. We knew it. You know, he's just a bum. You know, so we're going to do things smart. The whole fucking first part of my career, I try to be a company man and take all these fights that I know I shouldn't have took. On short notice, I had seven fights in the UFC my first go-round. Six of them were on short notice. And I think everybody I lost to is in the top 15, top 10. You know what I mean? So it's like, shit, that don't, nobody cares about who you fought or who you lost to or if you took it on short notice or if you were trying to please the matchmakers or Dana White. Nobody cares about that. You know what I mean? What they care about is wins and losses. That's it. So I learned that the hard way. So not going out chasing the money, not going out chasing the – um, big paychecks and and, and 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 taking stupid fights, you know. I'm gonna fight when I'm ready, and when I and I'm gonna fight, you know, who I want to fight, you know. And then when the time comes, we'll make the big matchups happen. You know what I mean? There's already a few. There's already a few fish I want to fry out there. You know what I mean? But right now we're gonna slow play it, build the build the career up get a couple new contracts and then we'll start looking at some bigger fights, you know? So that's where I was. You know what I mean? Jace, congratulations, man. Amazing performance. Good to see you back in the UFC. Good to see you back on Twitter. Enjoy it. Smell the roses for a bit. Look forward to seeing what is next for you down the line. And hopefully the, the, the fellow firefighters aren't grilling you too bad and making you clean toilets or anything after getting a win. I know how that works. My father was uh, a firefighter. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah. Hey, to, yesterday was, uh, last, yesterday's shift was my last day as a, as a recruit, man. So I put my year in, did the academy. I put my year in at, 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 at on rotations, and um, so I'm going from a uh, uh, from a uh, I'm graduating from a maggot to a fly. So you know what I mean. I got you know what I mean. I'm, I'm going to be a one officially a firefighter one, and um, we're going to go from there. I finally be able to sit in the recliners instead of having to watch TV at the dinner table. So it's going to be nice. It's going to be real nice. There's a lot to be congratulated for. That's another know, thing. Thank man. you for the time, man. This is this is amazing, man. Congratulations. It's good to see you back. All right. Chase Sherman. Wrapping up another edition of What the Heck on MMAfighting.com. This was uh this was a fun one to say the least, and I cannot believe we have done eight of these things already. I really can't. And I appreciate all of you checking out the show each and every week. The feedback has been been really good and that means a lot to me and i know i have said this before and i promise you that this is happening but there will be new programming coming your way on this network within the next couple of weeks at least that is the plan that is what i'm being told so more on that to come very very soon hopefully we get to make an official announcement on that and get you all excited for some some new things we're going to try out here on mmafighting.com so with that being said make sure you subscribe to the network right here on youtube also, wherever it is, you listen to your favorite podcast, Apple Podcast, Stitcher, Spotify, shout out Joe Rogan. That's amazing. $100 million to get the exclusive on the Joe Rogan experience. You know, people are like, wow, that's a lot of money, but I think Spotify is actually getting a bargain there. But uh, that's Joe Rogan. We're talking about MMAfighting.com. Subscribe. You get shows like the A-Side Live Chat with Jose Youngs. Angela Hill was on yesterday. Really great episode. Highly recommend you check that out. We have Eurobash with the legend himself, Pete Carroll and Niall McGrath. Coffee Talk, all of our pre and post shows. Subscribe, just do it. It's free. You push way less buttons in the future. So you hit the subscribe button once, just once. And these episodes on the podcasting networks, they automatically download to the device of your choice. So save yourself some time. That's what I'm trying to do for you. Save time, ladies and gentlemen. And with that, I am done rambling. No more from me. We will see you next week here on What the Heck. Stay locked into MMAfighting.com for the latest news on these upcoming fight cards. And as always, have a heck of a week, everybody. You're listening to the Vox Media Podcast Network.